and it's hard these days to imagine. We're all used to Apple having the best-selling phone on the planet, a well-respected lineup of notebooks and all-in-one desktop computers, and offering services like the iTunes Store. But in the mid-1990s, Apple really was just a few weeks from going broke. In this video, I'm going to be looking at some of the products that show exactly the mentality and kind of product confusion that led Michael Dell saying in 1997 that if he were running Apple, I'd shut it down and give the money back to the shareholders. Now there were many factors that led to this sorry state of affairs, most of which having to do with poor choices from the upper management. Upon his return in 1997, Steve Jobs found the company had lost over a billion dollars and was 90 days away from insolvency. But how did it get so bad? Just how bad were Apple's products at this time? Off the back of the original Apple II, the company grew to be a huge and trusted brand. The original Mac launched in 1984 was years ahead of its time, packing a groundbreaking graphical based operating system into a tiny 128 kilobytes of RAM, and that was no mean feat. Let's face it, the original Mac was just adorable. But after the board ousted the real creative power behind that first Mac, Steve Jobs, Apple itself stagnated, where Jobs and the original Mac team wanted to move on to bigger and better things. John Scully, Apple's CEO at the time, favored expanding the lineup with ever more models based on the Mac's original formula. Because it already had a huge lead in graphically oriented programs, the Mac found a niche in the creative industries, most notably graphic design and print. The product line expanded in line with this market who could generally afford to spend a bit more on high-end kit. In 1993, Apple had diversified their product line into Classic, the all-in-one form factor successors to the original Mac, Macintosh 2, a desktop model, LC, a low-cost desktop range, Centris, the lower-end professional range, Quadra, the high-end professional workstation range that came in desktop and tower configurations, and PowerBook, the portable range. It was a confusing lineup with lots of products and no clear delineation between the different models in different lines. Apple's hardware, and certainly their prices, weren't aimed at the consumer market, but starting in 1992, they rebranded some of their models with the Performer moniker. The initial offerings, Performer models 200, 400 and 600, were actually rebadged versions of the Classic 2, LC and Mac 2 VI but they were bundled with fun 90s edutainment software to appeal to the home market. Up to this point, Apple's machines all ran the Motorola 68K family of processors, the 68030 in most models and the more powerful 68040 processor in the Centris and Quadra models, the fastest of which clocked in at 33 MHz. By 1994, Apple was ready for the processor transition and the fruits of their alliance with IBM and Motorola to develop the PowerPC processor were now ready for commercial use. The PowerMac 6100 was the first machine to ship with this new processor, the PowerPC 601. Clocked it up to 100 MHz, this was a huge jump in speed on paper. Unfortunately, the Mac's operating system at the time, System 7, wasn't ready for the new processors. Huge parts of the OS were running in 68K emulation mode and with only some applications ready to take advantage of the new RISC-based architecture. Apple were working on some new operating systems at the time that were planned to address this. But for this video, I'm going to focus on the Performer 6200 and its relatives, the Performer 5200, 5300 and 6300. Now my first Mac was the Performer 6320, a machine that I loved and led to a lifetime 
love of Apple products. But when you know what's happening inside, the machine itself was bad. I mean, really bad. The Performa 6200 launched in 1995, and while it sold in some markets as the PowerMac 6200 in the US and UK, only the Performa branded consumer model was available. It shared its outer appearance with the Quadra 630, the cases being almost identical, and it touted an impressive sounding PowerPC 6 03 processor clocked at 75 MHz. From 1993, Apple's CEO had been Michael Spindler, a man apparently obsessed with cutting costs. Under his direction, the product line had not only exploded into a confusing mess, but bulk manufacturing components and using them across as many different models as possible was seen as the best way to save money and the company itself. The Performer 6200 is probably the model that had the most compromises of any due to this policy. For a start, as well as borrowing the case from the discontinued 630 product, much of its inner guts were also carried over. Now I'm going to get a bit technical here to explain some of the problems that this created. Please bear with me. Keeping some of the same things made good sense. People were definitely up in arms when the iMac launched with no ADB mouse port. But some of the methods used to shoehorn a PowerPC into an architecture designed for an older CPU led to some massive problems. For a start, the Quadra was designed for the Motorola processor with a 32-bit bus. This was replaced with a PowerPC 603 with a 64-bit bus. To save money, the inventory of 32-bit SIMRAM was used in the performer. Now this meant that every time the CPU needed to run an instruction from RAM, it first had to load 32 bits of, of RAM into the cache. Then, it had to load the second 32-bit segment from RAM to fill the remainder of the cache. Then, it had to run another cycle to combine the two 32-bit segments into a 64-bit segment to be executed, before finally it was ready to process any instructions. This meant that the CPU was effectively doing twice as much work as necessary, wasting valuable processing cycles simply managing the memory. Some other machines had the same problem of using existing 32-bit RAM and a CPU of a 64-bit bus, but the PowerMac 6100 and contemporary Windows machines dealt with this by splitting the 64-bit bus across two RAM modules and reading and writing simultaneously from both modules at once. This gave the illusion of a single 64-bit read-write cycle. This is where the idea of matched pairs of RAM comes from. As for this to work, the two 32-bit RAM modules should ideally be identical. But to further save money, most variations of the uh, Performa 6200 only ship with a single RAM module, meaning that this trick just doesn't work. Moreover, all of the other components have 32-bit address spaces too. To solve this, Apple got somewhat inventive. They split the performance board into a left 32-bit and write 32-bit address space. Networking, SCSI, audio and ADB ports all sat on the left, while RAM, graphics, IDE and the optional TV tuner sat on the right. This splitting of the board into two separate sections meant that the CPU could, was the only part that could access every component on the board. For SCSI attached CD-ROMs to load data into RAM, it would first have to send the data to the CPU through the left 32-bit side of the board, and then the CPU would forward it onto the RAM via the right 32-bit side of the board. The same was true for networking and printing, and this caused these functions to be painfully slow. The RAM, graphics controller, and IDE hard drive sat on the right-hand side which at least meant that these were able to communicate 
with each other without the need for CPU intervention. In fact, this splitting goes even further. The network controller had dedicated 16-bit out of the 32 bits on the left-hand side of the board. This meant that there was no bandwidth for separate network serial and printer ports, so the serial controller was simply removed. In this model, if you install a network card, the serial port becomes inoperable. Its controller is now being used for networking. Given that the CPU was already managing the bottleneck created by having 32-bit RAM, the impact of having to manage data flowing across components led to some pretty alarming issues, like audio stuttering when typing, because the remaining 16-bit path on the left-hand side of the board was used for both ADB keyboards and audio. The next problem with using existing inventory of components is to do with speed. Specifically, you, the clock speed of each different component. The 6200 processor was clocked at 75 MHz, but the bus itself ran at half that, 37.5 MHz. That's not actually unusual. More often than not, a processor will be able to carry out multiple instruction cycles in between needing to talk to other components. The problem was that other components on the board ran at different speeds. The memory and graphics controllers ran at 33 MHz, the IDE controller ran at 12.5 MHz, the networking, SCSI, audio and ADB ports all ran at 10 MHz. Again, it's not entirely unusual for components to run at different speeds, but typically this will be handled using something called a multiplexer. A multiplexer is a chip that sits between components running at different speeds, and it uses a small cache to keep the two sides in sync. It saves up cube data from the faster side and delivers it to the slower side when that's ready to accept it. But while these were used in the Quadro 630, for the performer they were deemed too expensive. So, without multiplexers, the 6200 uses a single motherboard clock running at 25 megahertz to keep everything in sync. The ROM holds routines that allows the CPU to send data to the component only at a rate that each can handle. So, for example, the 10 megahertz network bus is sent data only once on the second out of every five motherboard cycles, and the CPU runs at one and a half times the speed of the motherboard. Everything is coordinated by the CPU, further adding to its workload. In fact, Apple had to recall a batch of early machines due to problems with the ROM. And they fixed this issue, which was related to open transport, by reducing the graphics controller to running at only 30 MHz. With the CPU spending most of its time keeping the rest of the machine working, performance was a major issue for users. Now lastly, remember that there were only two controllers for the printer and serial port. Adding a network card would disable the serial port. Apple further saved costs by using cheap controllers that lacked a feature called hardware handshaking. This killed the speed of network connections to a mere 9600 board. That's 9.6 kilobits per second. Only a few very rare modems that had hardware handshaking built in on their end can reach the heady speeds of 56k. The compromises that Apple made in developing the Performer 6200 series, while creative, led to some pretty terrible performance. This not only damaged the reputation of the machine, but actually also the PowerPC processor itself. Similarly clocked Windows PCs were easily outperforming the 603 equipped Mac. This reputation was somewhat unfair, but PowerPC's reputation suffered and even the higher-end 604 powered machines aimed at the pro market and built without the compromises were somewhat tarnished. By 1996, these machines were joined by a confusingly named PowerMac 4400. This was a budget workstation built around the PowerPC 603 CPU. This machine marked a new philosophy of using off-the-shelf PC parts to reduce costs rather than re relying on expensive in inventory. The board was partly developed for the short-lived Mac clone market. Sadly, this cheap model and the clones based on it hurt the reputation of the PowerPC 603 even.
Michael Spindler now replaced by new Apple CEO Gil Emilio, the next generation performer machines didn't have the same design issues as Apple were now bulk buying 64-bit DIMM RAM to be used across the entire product line. The extremely rare Performer 6360 has the same form factor as the 6200 series, but dramatically improves performance by removing most of these compromises. The all-in-one version, the Performer 5400 and its successor, the 5500, finally managed to overcome the reputation of the PowerPC 603, and a black version was shipped in Europe, including the previously optional TV tuner and marketed at the height of multimedia buzz. The 6200 desktop was replaced with the Tower Style 6400, which featured the same innards as the 5400. The more powerful Performer 6500 had an option for a 100 megabyte zip drive and was the first Mac to clock in at over 300 megahertz, beating out Windows competition to this speed landmark. Despite the bizarre rounded tower aesthetic, these machines were starting to regain respect in the Apple community but lacked much broader appeal. The 20th anniversary Mac would also feature the same logic board. During Emilio's reign, the product lineup started to simplify and work began on a new consumer-based product to replace the Performer line. Designed by Johnny Ive, this machine would go on to become the iMac, launched in 1998 by Steve Jobs. It later shipped with macOS 8.5, which was rewritten to be PowerPC native. In 1997, the Power Mac G3 launched, and Apple distanced themselves from the PowerPC name instead focusing on the G3 part. By including a G3 processor in the new consumer model, the community felt the consumer model was now on a par with the professional lineup. With a radical, fun design breaking the convention of beige boxes, Apple had a winning formula and the fortunes of the company began to turn. Jobs slashed the confusing lineup of Mac's just four core models. And with a new focus, marketing and innovations brought about by Jobs, the company began to recover, marking the end of the Apple Dark Ages. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, please like it and look out for new content coming soon.